Howdy, BookTube! <laughs> As you know, June is a time for an inaugural BookTube event, June on the Range, created by Michael K. Vaughan and designed to celebrate Westerns. Western fiction, Western novels, Western short stories, even a couple of Western doorstoppers. Uh, partly in a sense of exploration, a great number of people who have been emailing me about their participation in June on the Range have been telling me that before June on the Range, they never considered reading a Western. They, they the used paperbacks are ubiquitous in used bookstores. They never even thought to do it. I've had a number of people email and say the combination, I was rather touching. A number of you have emailed separately, so you don't know each other, and yet the same sentiment has been expressed, that if anybody, if any combination of people was going to get them to read a Western, even though they had no inclination to do it, it was going to be the group of co-hosts that Michael K. Vaughn has assembled. Uh, because apparently we are among the our, the co-hosts for this event are among some of the, your favorite cheerleaders for being an explorative reader, for being an adventurous reader. But books aren't going to sting you. Just pick it pick it up. You might find something new that you really like. Uh, I am very happy to be in such distinguished company. If if that's a quality that's leading people to read westerns, that's fine by me. I've also heard. Uh, another element that, that infuses June on the Range is sentiment. A great number of you have emailed me about how you never really considered reading a Western, even though you associate them with your father, your grandfather, depending on the age of the person emailing, and that you saw those books growing up. You knew that they were the things that your father or your grandfather read, but never thought about reading them yourself. Uh, and that that's touching in a way that is certainly not true for me, and I didn't expect that that element of, of June on the Range would be so strong. Uh, but there's another element of June on the Range. Believe it or not, these are all fairly uh, fairly serious elements, but it, the main element of June on the Range is fun. But another element that comes up is also a little bit on the melancholy side, which is that this is a funeral. Westerns are, are practically dead as a genre. The only time that anyone in the present day writes a book that could, in its outer lineaments, be a Western is when they are seeking to tell a very 21st century story, usually involving Twitter politics, or when they're subverting the whole thing, when they're making fun of it, uh, when they're making fun of the whole genre, the, whole, the fact that the whole genre ever existed. Uh, that's not really continuation, and aside from that, uh, there's not much. <laughs> Aside from that, there's not much. Uh, you, there are a couple, I would say probably half a dozen, dedicated Western authors who are still doggedly publishing books. There are a couple of Western series that have a new entry every month. I see them in the advanced catalogs, but I don't even think about reading them. I just, it seems such a zombie category now with no life in it at all. Uh, ironically enough, there is one area of modern day publishing where the Western, at least in some genealogical line, continues very healthily. And I'll be getting to that in June on the Range. That is, of course, romance novels. Uh, and I'm not just talking with, with romance novels. The Western is very much alive, but it's also very much contemporary. And that leads, we are going to have to have one of my June on the Range videos or more than one. It's going to have to be categorical. I put off so far because it's, it's such a sweet tooth of mine that I don't want to overindulge. Uh, but what is a Western? Is a great question. Lots and lots of you have been emailing me about, you know, what about this? What about that? It lacks some essential element or it seems to have them all, but it doesn't seem to fit. I think a great number of people who like Westerns or who are at least open to liking Westerns, uh, would completely dismiss contemporary romance Westerns as not being Westerns at all. And I think a large part of that is probably genre snobbery. Uh, but I'm curious to know if that is a survival. If, if the modern contemporary romance Western is the last survivor of the world-dominating clade of the Western novel, in much the same way that birds are the last survivor of the world-dominating clade of dinosaurs, then I'd like to know why. I'd like to know exactly how we do that and what they share in common and how they're different, that, that sort of thing. Of course, in a Western that's, ro that's a romance, there are different concentrations. The, the plot is concentrated usually on something different. The plot of most Westerns 
boils down to a concentration on justice. Uh, and I don't know, uh, Ollie at Criminali often talks about the fact, about his beloved garbage, he often talks about the fact that garbage will be mimicking, consciously or unconsciously, preoccupations of the society in which the book is written, at the time when it's written. I think that's fascinating, and I would wonder if there's a correlation between uh, the popularity of Westerns as a genre of fiction and the prevalence of violent crime in America, the birthplace of the Western. I would wonder if that's true, and that maybe the Western's preoccupation with frontier justice, with getting justice when nothing seems willing to give it to you, maybe that corresponds? I don't know. Is there a correspondence between the death of the Western and the extremely low numbers of violent crime in America? Do those graphs go down at the same time? And if so, is that the reason? The one for the other? Be very interested to think that out. I will be doing categorical, you know, quantitative videos like that. But for today, I'm just moving ahead with reading Westerns. I'm reading a ton of Westerns, far more than I've been talking about on this channel. I spent the first week of June on the Range reading Louis L'Amour, uh, a writer who is synonymous with the genre. And... Uh, uh, one of you left a, a really good comment on uh, yesterday's video, I think, or the day before that, saying that the, Zane Grey was writing westerns long before Louis L'Amour. That's true, but I never said that Louis L'Amour was a trailblazer. I only said he is synonymous with the genre. And no matter what kind of a hipster originalist fan you are for Zane Grey, there is no denying the fact that, that when you think western, you think Louis L'Amour. That, that those two things are synonymous. That's all I was saying. I wasn't claiming that he was better than Zane Grey. Uh, but I spent, I spent a good deal of time with his books, and I plan to spend a good deal more. I want to finish out June on the Range by tackling his longest western, The Lonesome Gods, uh, and see what there is there, see what's going on there. Now that I have a firmer grasp of what this guy does, what his tricks are, that sort of thing, but although Louis the Moore is synonymous with westerns, he's not the only one who wrote westerns once upon a time for about 50 years. Uh... Westerns were phenomenally popular, just phenomenally so. On the radio, on the TV, the longest-running TV show in, in history at the time, uh, in the movies and in the bookstores. Westerns were extremely popular. You could get one, it would be cheap, it could usually be guaranteed to appeal to you, and writers knew that publishers always needed that. There was a yawning maw. Publishers needed as many Westerns as they could get their hands on. So if you were a hack, <laughs> if you were, let's say, trained to do an ungodly number of words at one sitting at your typewriter, uh, all for an audience, all for enjoyment's sake, and you knew that, and the publisher knew that, and you turned your hand to Westerns, you could churn out quite a few uh, and probably make a good side living doing it. Uh, which is why so many Western authors have such large bibliographies. They write dozens and dozens, sometimes hundreds, of novels. Uh, and that same combination of, of uh, necessary qualities also might explain why so many newspaper men <laughs> uh, drifted towards Westerns. Because they were the original Old Bailey hacks. They, you put them in front of a Remington, not the rifle, but the, the typewriter, and they could bash out a Western in, uh, let's say, 10 work sessions. 10 work sessions. A work session being five or six hours at the typewriter with an overbrimming ashtray next to you and maybe a shot glass at the other side. 10 sessions like that, and you've got, an, you've got a manuscript. Now, no one's going to scrutinize that manuscript. No one's going to comb over it for... Uh, uh, Chekhovian illusions or anything like that. It basically has to have two eyes, two ears, and a nose. And you get your money. Whether it's $250 or $2,000. So you, you get your money and you go on to the next one. Uh, it, newspaper people <laughs> are accustomed to writing under those conditions. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. When you are a hack writing for deadlines... 
scratching and pecking at the ground for whatever check won't bounce, uh, you will very quickly become accustomed to writing coherent prose, maybe even good prose, extremely fast <laughs> and needing very little in the way of an editorial safety net. Uh, which is why I think so many of the Western authors of the first half of the 20th century, for instance, were also newspaper men or got their training that way. Even Louis L'Amour did. Uh, and so did the, the writer that I, that I want to talk about today. Just briefly, I am no expert on these things, but I am exploring and I'm having fun doing it. The writer is Nelson Nye, and the novel is Rafe. Uh, with a, a kind of nice cover here. The, Nelson Nye was a newspaper man. Uh, wrote book jacket copy, wrote uh, anonymous ad blurbs, wrote book reviews, lots and lots of book reviews, signed and unsigned, uh, wrote all sorts of things under pseudonyms, wrote basically, basically, he knew himself to be and put word around in the first half of the 20th century that he had a typewriter and he knew how to use it. That, that if you needed something, if you needed prose and you had a little money to part with to get that prose, he would not let you down. You would get your prose. If you get a reputation like that in the 1940s, late 1930s, early 1950s, if you get a reputation like that, work will come your way. If you don't let anybody down, if you don't miss your deadlines, even if, you know, <laughs> the greatest of all, cherries on top, maybe you get some sales, you won't lack for work. And Nelson Nye didn't. He wrote dozens and dozens and dozens of Westerns. And who knows how many other things, too. He's one of those, he's one of those writers that, as far as I know, he's never had a biography. Uh, and the more the old print newspapers vanish, the more they molder or get caught in fires or floods, the less chance there is that anyone ever could piece together the whole writing career of this guy. What he did and didn't do. Where are his letters? Where are his journal entries? Where are the people that knew him? Those vital primary records of, of, of first-class working hack are either frittering away completely or are gone already, which means, if the latter, that Nelson Nye's story cannot be reconstituted, which is a terrible shame. Uh, it would be interesting. I guarantee it would be. Uh, but he wrote he wrote tons and tons of books. And I came across this book. One of you sent me the ebook e of it. Uh, and I'd, I'd heard about Nelson Nye because of June on the Range, but I'd never read anything by him. Uh, not I've read some of his book reviews, but I'd never read any of his Western novels. Uh, and I, I picked Rafe just because I had an ebook of it and I had finished something that I'd been reading that night, wanted to, you know, I've been popping down Westerns left, right, and center. When, in the interstices between any kind of reading, the only thing that has disrupted that recently is Bring Up the Bodies by Hilary Mantel. One of you very kindly sent me the Canadian trade paperback of Bring Up the Bodies, and I fell right into it. A very slow read, very slow, where I'm, I'm crawling through it with a pencil as a bookmark so that I remember to annotate anything that I like. And I am having a ball absolutely having a ball. The one source of mourning for me with Bring Up the Bodies is that I don't have the Canadian trade paperback of The Mirror and the Light, the third book, the final book in the trilogy. And I know, I know that when I finish Bring Up the Bodies, I'm going to want to read Mirror and the Light just this way, in just that format. I guess I should probably just go online. I, although, if one of you lives in Canada and wants to go to your bookstore and buy a copy of The Mirror and the Light in the Canadian trade paperback with the the floppy binding and the deckled edges and the French flaps and the embossed cover. If one of you who lives in Canada wants to do that, feel free and I will either reimburse you for the book and the shipping or I will reimburse you with books from the Brattle <laughs> of equal or greater value. I don't, I don't have to worry about it for a while. I don't, at the rate I'm going, I don't think I'm going to finish Bring Up the Bodies until the end of June. Uh, but it has been... It has been is stealthily gobbling up the little pieces where I would have popped down a Western, but I still do it. Uh, and I, so I read this one just because I had it. Uh, without doing my due diligence on the author or on whether or not I was catching him at his best, <laughs> to quote from The Voyage Home. Uh, and I'm definitely not. This is a bad book. <laughs> it's the story of the main character, Rafe, who was a, was a prisoner of war and a Civil War prisoner uh, 
prison camp. And then when he gets out, of course, his whole world has gone by. He's been out of the world for three years. So he needs to find his family again and also find out what's happening to their property. And that's a story on its own, a kind of, you know, Ulysses story of coming home uh, from the wars uh, that is almost totally lost right from the beginning of this book instead. Instead, you get the picaresque adventures of Rafe almost dying, cussing out his horse, using all sorts of really tin-plated period dialect in a, way that, in a way that I'm sure that Nelson and I thought was effective. I don't really... Either, either the idioms in this book are completely real. I think Nelson and I had quite a bit of experience with living remnants of the Old West. So either the idioms in this book are completely real and that's why they feel alien and odd, or they're completely made up, and he got them from other dime store western novels without ever approaching anything like verisimilitude. Either way, they take you out of the story every single time they happen. I'm not, I'm not really going to fault the book so much for that. There are so many other faults to choose from here. <laughs> the story is bungled. Uh, Rafe has no emotions, except a kind of Tom Sawyer... Dar tarnation, you city folks, is weird, uh, irritated wonder at everything that happens to him. You're doing what? You thinking what? You're saying what? It's like, okay, well, you you left home ten years ago. You went to war. You you lived in a con in a concentration camp. You'd think maybe you wouldn't be quite the the irascible twelve year old ingenue, but he is at every point an irascible twelve year old ingenue, and there are. I mean, at the beginning of the book and also in the middle, they, they they sort of burn off in the last act of the book. But in the first half of the book, the author goes out of his way to wind up all these Wheezebox comic set pieces, and they don't work. None of them do. They're just absolutely dead on arrival. There's drama in the final act. Maybe. I don't know how much of my lukewarm reaction to this book comes from one of two reasons, aside from the fact that it's bad. <laughs> one is that I think Rafe is very late in Nelson Nye's writing life. I think he wrote this 50 years into a writing career, not at age 50, but 50 years into producing work. That could wear anybody out, right? <laughs> that, that would, we talked about this yesterday, that could easily account for the problems with this book. What I should have done was hold out, ebook or no ebook, and read an early Nelson Nye. Read something that he wrote really early in his career when he still had a fire in his belly, when maybe he wasn't losing a step or two. I don't know. I will certainly try that. I won't be in any hurry to do it. The other possible explanation for the lukewarm reaction to this book, aside from the, the aforementioned fact that it is bad, uh, is that I'm coming straight from Louis L'Amour. It's true, I'm coming from Louis L'Amour late in his own career, but... He's a hell of a lot more effective than this book. I think Louis L'Amour, in his sleep, would have written this book better than Nelson Nye did. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not going to rush to read, and I will need, read another Nelson Nye uh, for June on the Range. I'm not, I'm not going to wait until next year or anything like that. But I, I'm going to read something completely different, a completely different author uh, tonight, if Thomas Cromwell will let me. <laughs> Plus, I have actual reading to do, you know, for my job and all. <laughs> but but uh, the free time reading, so to speak, Bring Up the Bodies is taking a lot of that, and oh my god, what a brilliant book. Oh my god, I knew it was brilliant. I read the, I got the galley copy. I think I had it on this channel. I got the galley copy, then I got the finished copy. I read both of them. I read the finished copy with a pencil in hand. It didn't take nearly as many annotations as I'm doing now, but I did. I loved it. I reviewed it <laughs> for uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal. I think I was I, I. It was a it was a fairly big journal that I reviewed it from. I'm not off the top of my head remembering talking about being a hack. <laughs> I am revealed <laughs> as, as just such a hack myself. I don't remember who I reviewed it for, but it was a big journal. My blurb is on the paperback, the American paperback. It's not on the Canadian paperback. Uh, without a name, I don't think I'm named in the blurb, but. Uh, the bigger the journal, the less likely that is, right? The bigger the journal, the more the publisher is looking just for the weight of the journal. 
and they don't care about who the individual person is. They, but anyway, uh, I feel certain that Thomas Cromwell will leave me time for another Western. Like I said, these things don't take long to do. You can you can read quite a few of them uh, if you do as much reading as I do. I'm I'm going to move away from Nelson Nye and read someone else. In fact, I might go back to Michael K. Vaughan's own uh, TBR video for June on the Range, where he names a whole bunch of, uh, of Western authors that uh, only some of whom I'd ever heard of, much less read. Maybe some of those are worth, a, are worth exploring. So I will keep you updated, but I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid Rafe uh, was not a hit. <laughs> not, the, the best thing about it was this cover. Uh, so <laughs> the rest of it was it was trying to amuse me and failing. It was trying to excite me and failing. It was trying to interest me and failing. By the time you get to the resolution of what happened to the family ranch, you don't care at all. <laughs> you, just, you just wish that one of the hot lead bullets that are flying would actually hit Rafe. <laughs> but I will have better luck tonight. I feel certain of it. You never know, though. One of the fun things about about June on the Range, also fun about uh, Criminali's upcoming event, Garb August, is that no one is claiming any great distinction for these things. There are some great westerns. I made a video, for instance, of of ten westerns that I believe actually are really good literature, well worth your time, with all the wheels of your brain engaged at the same time. But no one in June on the Range is claiming that most westerns are like that. Most of them are not like that. Uh, so it could be that I'll hit another dud. Uh, if so, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.